<laughs> okay. Um, it's just showing one o'clock by my clock, and we have a fairly full agenda. So I think uh, just to respect all of you who did get here on time, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to our two presenters, Diane Strickland and Carmen Lansdowne. Um, both of you uh, agreed to come on fairly short notice as I was scrambling around uh, going, wait, wait, what? It's already going to be Tuesday? <laughs> so um, thank you for responding to my invitation and uh, for being here. I know that both of you uh, are bringing some really important information to us today. I also have some announcements uh, and things that I'll share at the end of our time together. Um, but as we get going, I would like to welcome Blair Odney, who this will be, I think, your first time, uh, second time uh, on the town hall with us as uh, president of the Pacific Mountain Region. So um, thank you, uh, Blair, and uh, I'll turn things over to you. Uh, thank you, Trina. It's a privilege for me to be here and to see all of you out there. It's, uh, it's a glorious day here in New Westminster. The sun is pouring into my office. And uh, I, I have been working from, from, from my office since I moved to Queens Avenue on the 1st of July. And, and uh, it's just, it's, 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 it betrays what kind of what's going on. Today, uh, two days before 9-11, I'm thinking about Kairos moments. And thinking about those moments when mystery cuts obliquely across the chronology of time, forever changing our experience of time. I'm going to name a few. You can think of some too. The day the atomic bomb dropped in Hiroshima. Remember when Neil Armstrong uh, on the moon and said one giant step for man, one giant leap for humankind. The Montreal Massacre at Ecole Polytechnique. Remember the day that Elijah Harper raised an eagle feather in the Manitoba legislature, effectively ending the Meech Lake Accord. I, I, that's an image that I you know, I remember being at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and one woman in particular, and then the calls to action. All of those are Kairos moments. When what we understood of ourselves was changed by a transcendent moment. Some say that Paul Henderson's final goal in the last 34 seconds of the 1972 Canada-Russia Summit series was a Kairos moment. And for nearly 19 years now, we, rem we remember that what happened in New York City on September the 11th, 2001, dramatically altered our proximity, our perception, the, the, pr the dominant culture's proximity to the violence of warfare. And we've been at war, at war with an idea ever since. And then this year, the murder of George Floyd and the shooting of Jacob Black, all Kairos moments that have chained us. And you know, now on Sunday, for the first time in my lifetime, I will not be returning to a new church year with a welcome back service after a restful summer. This pandemic has remained virtually un unabated, leaving nearly 1 million people dead and more than 27 million cases. And our churches, are closed. At a time when isolation and fear threaten our lives, our church doors are closed. And while there's some of us who are planning some kind of return to live worship, it will require protocols and processes to make sure people are safe. But there'll be no coffee or dares oatmeal cookies. COVID-19 is certainly a Kairos time, something of mystery is cutting across our chronology of time. Of course, for us, there's really only one defining Kairos moment, a moment at which every knee shall bow and from whom every family on earth takes its name. The moment when the cracks of light broke the seal of death in an event that only God can make. That resur resurrection event did change time. And we discover daily in our practices 
how the force of love that rolled that stone away changes our own hearts one crack at a time. The question for all of us in response to this fear that gets generated by all those Kairos moments that have cut across our lives. The question is how will Easter live now? What do we do in the face of terror? In 1 John we read there is no fear in love but perfect love drives out fear. I think this is our only response. Fierce love in the face of terror. God's love for the world revealed at Easter is our only response. A love that will not let us go. Let me finish with Paul's word. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Please pray with me. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. There are only two feelings, love and fear. There are only two languages, love and fear. There are only two activities, love and fear. There are only two motives, two procedures, two frameworks, two results, love and fear. Author of the world's joy, bearer of the world's pain, at the heart of all our distress, let unconquerable gladness dwell. Amen. There you go. Thank you, Blair. That was, uh, that was great. Um, so uh, welcome again to Diane. Diane uh, has uh, been doing lots of work around the COVID pandemic because this falls into her area of specialty and she's uh, produced a couple of videos that uh, are very helpful and will uh, encourage you to watch. But, you know, as we started entering into the fall, I started thinking about, um, you know, how tiring this whole pandemic has been for all of us. And, uh, you know, it just, it just was uh, kind of dragging my heels into the fall a little bit. And I felt like I might not be the only one in that position. And so I thought that it was a good time for us to uh, hear from Diane and uh, hear about some of her work. So without further ado, Diane, I'll turn things over to you. There'll be an opportunity for questions at the end, but if you do have questions, you can feel free to type them in the chat and I'll moderate that. Um, and if you need to share your screen or anything, Diane, just let us know. Thank you. Uh, thanks for letting me be with you today. Um, and I already feel so much better because the gospel's just never a drag to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. And thank everyone for everything that you have done and tried to do since this whole thing started. Uh, you are heroic to me, and it's an honor to be among you and to be with you any way that I can. In talking about COVID fatigue, I'm going to be going back a little bit behind it to understand how we get there, what I think it is, uh, ways of mitigating it, where it does lead, however, and reframing that so we can find our best resources for that moment. Um, and then we'll have questions, discussion if you want, 
and I have notes in front of me because my memory is useless right now. So I just keep my notes with me. So the thing about pandemic life that we don't uh, re really realize is that we don't have any experience with it and anything that can really teach us what we need to know. So we're pulling, we're, we're pulling disaster data out all the time and madly reading about the Spanish flu. Uh, we were not ready for this. And in the pandemic section of my training, um, there's a, a, about a quarter of a page and then there's a link to the section on biochemical terrorism. So that's uh, where I ended up. And oddly enough, it, I see why now, because the steps are pretty much what we've been doing. We, we avoid public panic. We don't overwhelm hospitals. We triage to distinguish between symptoms of stress and trauma from the symptoms of possible infection. So we know who needs care immediately. We impose social constraints and we self-regulate to avoid infection. And it's really the last two things that cause the problems. Because when we have social constraints and self-regulation, we have to realize they've never been popular ideas to embrace. And when the information changes repeatedly about the whole situation, resistance to those last two things increases. And that becomes actually a part of what COVID fatigue is. People are sick and tired that they can't know what's happening ever. It, it changes. So therefore, the harder parts of the process we have to be in, which are really individual responsibilities, are the pieces that start to disintegrate. COVID fatigue results from individual and collective experiences of this shocking shift to living with chronic risk constraints on our freedoms, lack of stable knowledge about the threat itself, treatment uncertainties, supply chain problems, and collateral damage, like the world's economy and my finances and yours, and other stuff too. With COVID fatigue, it, it's not even that the cure is worse than the disease, because it's not even a cure. It's a let's not make this any worse strategy. That's what we've got. And in the long term, that ceases to be compelling. It's hard to rally people around social constraints and self-regulations with a call of let's not make it worse, which is why we heard it as flatten the curve. That's, I wondered how they were going to say it. That's how they said it. COVID fatigue for most of us is this totality of our symptoms. We have physical symptoms, like who, who has had a good night's sleep recently? E emotional symptoms, like I, I don't want to go to the grocery store because the grocery store is where everybody reports having ambushes of crying. Behavioral, you know, who's picking fights, um, who's drinking too much, cognitive symptoms, and I'd give you an example, but I can't remember it. Social, I, I miss my friends, I miss my family, I, I miss my colleagues, I miss my neighbors, I miss my life interacting with people. Spiritual, um, sometimes it's connected and sometimes it's not. Psychological. Okay, am I depressed yet? Is this depression? Have I gone over the edge? Am I in it? Those are just one example for each of those kinds of symptoms. And if, if we've been using coping tools, we may do better than others with these. We may be beating them back. But long term, people get sick of having to use the tools. They just want their life back. They may not have COVID, but they're sick and tired of something. And it's about, I don't want to identify my stress symptoms anymore, Diane. I don't want to figure out what coping tool might help and run experiments to see. And so symptoms start to blur into each other. 
and we can't really get a handle on them anymore. They leak into each other and that becomes this totality of things that wear us down. Or maybe they all collapse into one symptom that seems to want to run everything. Or there's a constant cascading of symptoms and they're happening faster. It's like a compression and, and suddenly you're in one and then boom, you're in the next one and then and it, you just are running with it and it's unmanageable. It's like the attack of the killer tomatoes. It's just too big and it's too red for mindfulness breathing that is still new for us to take it off. The result, when we get to that place, doubt creeps in. We aren't sure anymore about if we're gonna be able to put things back together or not. Or we're seeing things like relationships and other commitments like works and plans that we made and secrets that we keep. We see all these things differently now and we're not sure we want to do that anymore, any of those things. Or we have a really new clarity about what our values really are and we, we want to live more closely into them. COVID fatigue removes all the pieces of normal just enough for us to see what normal is hiding most of the time. And if we aren't going to get normal and all of the benefits back, then we have to find relief another way to keep all of it either going or to start letting it go. So COVID fatigue is not just how we feel. It's about what we are beginning to see differently. And that's exhausting. And it creates a context that's ripe for making life decisions that we didn't imagine were going to be in play. If we can't change the pandemic reality, we have to change our lives in order to keep going. And COVID fatigue takes us there. Thank you, Blair, for the Kairos moment <laughs> talk, because that's kind of what this is all about too, on a different level. Now, there are some who will point out that the third phase of the disaster recovery models for, uh, is, is really about what COVID fatigue is. And if you don't know about the phases of disaster recovery, you can Google that and there's a gazillion graphs that are quite wildly dramatic and have names on them. And we start at the heroic phase and then we go to the honeymoon phase and then we have the disillusionment phase, which is where people believe that, some people believe COVID fatigue belongs there. It's where people confront their new reality. It's where they deal with the losses that they realize they're going to have to accept. And they're going to look at the limits of their recovery that they see clearly now. And they come to terms with it for better or for worse. And I mean that truthfully. Some people come to terms with it for better and some go deeply into something worse. It's a hard time, but having worked two disasters, I'm not so sure that's really where we are, are after all. It's close. Heroic, yes, we had that moment. That's when we were all out in our porches clapping at 7 p.m. for our frontline workers. But we didn't have a honeymoon, which is really in disaster recovery is this embracing of a collective goal and purpose and a common working towards recovery. Um, I don't know when we ever had a honeymoon moment here. Maybe we had it for five minutes and I missed it. But in disaster, what happens to create disillusionment is the discovery that while people accept the uneven hand of the disaster, they struggle mightily with the uneven hand of recovery. And that's what becomes apparent as they worked on this collective goal they discover that it doesn't reward people collectively the same way. So that uneven hand pushes uh, people into disillusionment to this past co co uh, fatigue stage and to decision-making about what they're gonna do. Now for us, in my opinion, this is my opinion, what ripens COVID fatigue to our experience of disillusionment 
and to the decision making that has to come, it's a little different. And it's the critical difference between a pandemic and a disaster, which is that you can leave a disaster zone, but you can't leave a pandemic. I drove out a high river every day. And after eight days, I got on a plane and I flew out of Fort McMurray. You can't do that in a pandemic, it's everywhere. In a disaster zone, there's a world outside of it. And it provides this impetus to move faster through the fatigue to the disillusionment and to the challenges of that. And it's there so people can reconnect to something. Oh, there's the world, there's what it's doing. I can get traction on my life now because there, that's still going on. There's a normal, I can build my new normal. And, and I will be connected with that over there. But we don't really have any world outside our pandemic. And that's why a lot of us are always listening to the news, looking to hear about any country that has figured anything out and is putting life back together. That's what we're looking for, that world. My hunch, is that the disillusionment for us is that there is no relief for our symptoms. That there is no world of normal to be had. And that it, it, when it comes, it will be a normal that nobody wants. We are worn down to the nub. So here's the little uh, important point that has to be said is that if you're there and you can't dig your way out at all, you have to get help. And there's all kinds of help. There's spiritual directors, there's personal coaches, there's uh, possibly other colleagues who can help you, maybe, maybe not. There are licensed counselors, there are therapists, and if you can find a clinical traumatologist, you've hit pay dirt. But those are the people that you have to seek. And you, if you can't, get it with the first person, you have to try somebody else. Um, we, we have to get over not dealing with the fact that we're in trouble. If we're in trouble, we have to get help. That is the most critical thing for people who are leaders in their faith communities, whether or not they're ministry personnel. You know, you know we all have congregations where we could tell you, the lay people, whether they have an office in the church or not, whether that person is actually a PowerPoint in that congregation. And when those people go down, everybody's sh shaken by it. We have to get the help we need. So if that's where this is where you are and you can't find a way out, that's what you've got to do. Please let me encourage you. I do it. Lots of other people do it. It's what we need to do. However, the story doesn't end there because COVID fatigue, when it reaches us, when it gets us to that point where we're at the end and there's nothing, we've got nothing. We don't know what to say. I've got nothing. It moves us to a crossroads, just like the Kairos moment that Blair talks about, only a smaller scale, probably. It's a crossroads moment where a lot of things can happen. And hopefully what we find there is another path to participate in life with commitment again. And I know this is possible. And I know that some of you know that is possible. But you need to hear it again. You need to hear it a different way. We don't want to do that work in a free fall. It doesn't work that we can't do it in a free fall. We, we need a world that is a reference point. We need something that helps us to get traction on how we're gonna make decisions we, we suddenly feel we have to make. Um, to do the work that is about identifying and accepting loss 
It is very much about that. And some people have done that work already in their lives. Some of you that are listening to me right now have, have done that, have had to do that for a different kind of reason. But you've been to these kinds of crossroads before where you, you really didn't have anything left. And so you had to find another way to get to the rest of your life. And part of that is looking at, okay, I cannot, I cannot sit and stare at what I've lost anymore. I've lost it. I have to honor it and somehow find a way to carry it forward without it running everything. There are losses in this experience. They, some of them are temporary, some of them are permanent, and they, they run the gamut of every topic. As I tried to talk about, the things that come up for people in this situation are everything. Um, I just finished a, a, a big piece on this, the growing panic about pastors who will be leaving churches be, on the heels of this. And, and we know this statistically, that, for example, that after disasters, ministers leave more quickly than statistically is the norm, which is why I, I was sent to places that had disasters, was to try to help them avoid doing that if, they, if it really wasn't needed. Well, now there, there's, only, there's not enough people to go and help other people. So that, that's one thing is, what about our calls? Are they in play now? Relationships. Is it time to end them? You know, all of these kinds of things. Our retirement plans have changed. All of these things are lost for some people. Um, so losses have to be identified and accepted. That's a part of this process. It's about truth-telling, where you have, may have kept secrets that you can't keep any longer and creating realistic expectations for your recovery to understand that it's going to be different and going forward into this different reality, the world after what happened. Now, my point of view is that we really aren't in free fall. We are, as people of faith, citizens of another world where we can use that world to move through this whole painful process, process of identifying losses and all that stuff, realigning ourselves with the truths and the promises and the gifts of this world we profess as real, where, where God is at work and creating. That's inside us. It's around us. So for me, COVID fatigue is what washes us up onto a, a biblical beach. Uh, a profound opportunity for deepening spiritual faith and life. Now, you may not want to hear that right now, but I hope you'll remember it when you do need it. Because when COVID fatigue ripens into decision making, when we're in that world of sacred promises and doing it in vocation and truth, that work is holy. It's hard, but it's holy. We have witnesses to that kind of work all through scripture. Holy Week is an obvious one because it was a week where it was full of trauma and critical decisions for better or worse. It had losses, you know, all the way through. We don't need to name them all. You know the story. The point is that Code fatigue is not a clinical or spiritual dead end. It becomes like a holy week where we don't, we lose control of the story for a while. And we either have someone who's working away in the story that we can trust or we don't. Who are we going to be? I don't know. Who am I going to be after this? Who, what are my life going to reveal? You know, what are we bringing to the table now that we weren't bringing to the table before to sustain other people? What are we teaching our children about what you do when this stuff happens? And what does it mean for God to say, I love you, Diane? In the resources for this time, I do believe we are better prepared to do this work when we use the coping tools that are available. 
because we don't go down so far and we have a way to climb up even temporarily. And, you know, I, I do whole things just on coping tools. There are categories that I call breathe, breathing tools, like the mindfulness breathing one, moving tools, um, rest, resting tools, communicating tools, and feeling tools. And those are all the ways that we can ground ourselves with our symptoms, with our fatigue, our totality of fatigue, and connect us to reality that is beyond us and within us, but more than pandemic. That's what gives us an impetus to keep going. The same way that the world outside a disaster zone gives a disaster survivor in a disillusionment phase, a reference point to keep going in a life that they know is gonna be really different. COVID fatigue is not bigger than the gospel. The gospel that first found us, that came home with us and invited us to serve it. It's another chapter of a faith story that we're living. And we already know the last word has been spoken for it. But COVID fatigue is something to understand. And I guess that's, that's the way we understand how we find the Kairos moment in it, because it's there. I'll stop there for now and see, see if there's anything anybody wants to ask or say. Thank you, Diane. So if you have a question, you can raise your virtual hand. Uh, you can type it in the chat or um, you can unmute yourself and speak up if, if accessing either of those options are not possible. It's a lot to think about. I can offer a few of the, the things that I do in that process if, if there's nobody wants to. Thank it doesn't you. look like there's any questions, so that would be great. Thanks, Diane. Okay. Um, one of the things I use is the communion table, and I've used it literally when I've been there, or I, I just imagine it in my head. And when I feel that moment when I have to start identifying the things that I might be losing or the things I have lost. Um, I put them on the table in my mind and I, I put them there because I know it's safe there. That's where Jesus put everything on the table and God works with it. And I, I am prepared that I may never get it back or it may come back to me exactly as it was, or it may come back to me completely different. But that exercise is one of the ways that I try to ritualize and imagine what the work is that, it, that is in this process of when, you, when you've finished and you've got nothing left, and it's a bit of a panic moment, then I put it there. So that's one thing I do. Help me access your tools. Okay, that's another whole workshop. <laughs> that's, I don't have that. Well, I guess they're written. They're in some of the, uh, the pandemic practicum videos. There's a few there. And I, there's probably a few in the other videos too. But, um, it's it is a whole it's a whole thing that that uh is a separate piece of work but they are important um because they're the things that will ground you and keep you from float, floating away and uh hold you in in your life and and that's what's really important for doing that even if you don't know what to do you don't drift away which is dissociation that's the technical term, but I used to consider myself a flight risk in a lot of church meetings. So, uh, but yeah, go ahead. 
Um, I was just I was just laughing at being a flight risk at church meetings. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, actually, I, <laughs> listen. Uh, that, I, when I was developing tools, I had a colleague, and when we would go to synod or whatever we called conference, when we go to conference, um, we had a a covenant together that we would start our morning with yoga practice to get us grounded. And then we would do mindfulness breathing and we would go and we were seated at different tables. But uh, with the moment we, we started to go somewhere else that we thought was more interesting in our heads, we would breathe, we would do our mindfulness breathing and go back into our bodies. And if one of us was completely out of it, we would leave the room and the other would go and we would do something together to bring ourselves back. And what, that was an experiment. We thought we've, we've got to do something. We can't do this anymore. I could not believe how it changed the way I participated in that meeting and, and how I suddenly saw the person beside me and then over the course of a day had a, quite a profound interaction with her. And so I thought, this is really crucial. These tools are not um, for someone like me, at least I needed them to, to stick around. <laughs> Um, so there's a question in the chat about spiritual practices. Um, so you've just touched on that a little bit. Is there anything you want to add? To They're that? all spiritual practices for me. Um, and, and that's why I, when I talk about breathing uh, tools, the story, of course, is that's the most important for me about those is, is Jesus meeting the disciples who were terrified in the upper room and you know, they, they act out their fear and their demands for proof, whatever. And when that's all over, it says, Jesus breathed on them. And, and I, I just find that um, it's like, okay, you've exhaled. Here's your breath back. And, and I find that's a good story. Um, there are the, the resting tools are all grounded in Sabbath practice, which is about learning to not be in charge of the world because apparently, you know, God is at work and, and I don't have to be all the time. So that's a relief. I, I get a few minutes off every day. <laughs> that's the but, uh, functional atheism concept that Parker Palmer talks about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, a, it's a astonishing to me. So I have now a practice of, of lying down. I don't have to sleep because I, I was the kid in nurse in kindergarten who was nearly went out of their minds at nap time because I could not do that. Um, but now I don't worry about whether I sleep. I just rest in God. Okay, I'm not going to do anything because I need to stop. So all of the tools are spiritual practices. That's what they are. Walking, moving is walking and pilgrimage and all the rest of it. Yeah. Thank you. Dave Morris, you have a question? You can just unmute yourself. Yeah, I guess I was just thinking about, and I know individual um, understandings about an individual like <clears throat> COVID uh, fatigue for the individual can't be applied to communal uh, living, but I, I'm just interested in the community fatigue, communal fatigue, congregational fatigue around COVID, especially around the gaining, tra I guess what stepped out from me is the gaining some traction so you can make good decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if there's any way to apply any of your understanding of the individual COVID fatigue and finding traction, um, stabilizing, whatever that might look like, it can be just you've got some experience of communities finding ways to gain traction so they can uh, make good decisions, be good for one another, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. There is a little bit on that in the in the videos that I did on reentry, and you may be able to adapt some of that stuff. Um, what what I can tell you is that um, what I when I talk with clergy one on one, who are or people who are leading worship in our churches, um, I invite them to take the spiritual practices that are coping tools and put them in the worship service, so that we are doing that. And, and then uh, we are also doing them in our homes. So we may not say grace at the table, but we'll do intentional breathing. When we talk, tuck our children into bed at night, we will do a cycle of breathing with them. So we're all learning 
how to do. And it, it comes back at you. You know, when your children see you freaking out, you need to breathe, Mom, which is really annoying. <laughs> but it's, it's true because that's what children do, right? They learn and then they give it back to you. Um, congregations will do that too. Um, the other tool I've talked about is the SUDS tool, which is the subjective units of distress tool, which you can download. It's, I think the Wikipedia version is the, is the one I use, is lots of them. And I use that um, individually. And it's simply, a, you, it was used so that therapists could say, okay, tell me what your distress level is today. And it tells you, describes where they are, sort of one to 10. So um, you can use that individually, but you can also teach, your, teach that to your um, boards in sessions or whatever you are, you're calling them where you are, councils. Um, and it's not that you do that work together and share it, it's that you do it and everybody takes responsibility for the level of stress they are in. And that changes our behavior. So when I come into a meeting now and I'm, I know I'm a seven because of a conversation I just had and I'm not over yet, I shut up for a while because I know I'm still talking out of that conversation. So we teach people how to be aware of their feelings and be aware of stuff that they don't, we put every, we're doing so many things, we put stuff places, but they're still talking and they're still affecting us. So part of that is, I, that's why identifying your symptoms is so important because most of the time uh, when I work with clergy, they don't think they have any because they're preaching well. And mea culpa, been there, done that. As long as I'm preaching well, I think I must be doing everything well. No. And other people come and tell you what you're not doing well. <laughs> so it, it's, um, I don't know, that's sort of a, a long way around to your question. Thank you. So we're, we're, I appreciate that. And uh, welcome to Dave, who's uh, the new minister at Shaughnessy. Um, so we're happy to have you in our region. Um, last question is uh, welcome, Jay. Dave. Yeah, thanks. Jay Olson has her hand up. And then I think we'll move on to Carmen. Thanks, Trina. It's not really a question, but something for exploration. And uh, I don't know, you might, Diane, have... Um, have something you can offer about this. Um, you had commented on the ministers who leave a community of faith around times of disaster. Some of us were already scheduled to leave and had transitions planned in new pastoral relationships. And Dave and Deb um, are two of my cohorts that are doing as I am. And I've moved into ministry with two small congregations or others on this call today that are doing the same. And I find that what has been most disorienting for me is that I don't have fundamental relationships or deep long-standing relationships that allow me to say to people, you know, well, I mean, I say it and, and they're magnificently welcoming and trusting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're not really bonded yet and I, I say all those things to them yeah breathe no hurry it doesn't really matter what other mm -hmm. churches are doing and how great they appear to be and how wonderful mm -hmm. everything looks on the internet we need to be who we are but I find it's a pretty big stressor uh, related to just not having fundamental relationships of yes. to build can you yeah. I mean I, I'm not looking for answers it's something that um, many of us right now on this call are living with. And it's, um, uh, that's for me the most disquieting piece of it all. Yeah, that's your collateral. That's how you get, is when you don't have those relationships, you don't have your collateral yet for people to really know why they're trusting you besides, you know, what's on your CV. I, in a time of anxiety, I, I, the question I, I continually tell people to ask, no matter what we're talking about, is where do you think the anxiety is gathering? So start asking that. Not, not necessarily out loud in your head. Where do you think the anxiety is? 
or sometimes you need to actually ask it. Tell me, what do you have anxiety around this? Tell me about this because I don't know you well enough. I don't know your story yet. What is the most anxious thing for you right now? And because I suspect you can respond to it, even if it's to say, thank you, I'll be very, very careful from now on. Or whether it's, um, I'm not going to leave. We're, we're in extremely difficult circumstances and I'm not going to leave without knowing who you are first. I think there's a lot of, um, I know when I, when I uh, was doing supply up in Fort McMurray, I started Lent up there and then I um, was supposed to come back and do Holy Week. And of course I was flying home on the fateful March 15th when the, everything changed, right? And so what I had to do my last time there, it's not enough people up there, we didn't have to worry about social distancing, but even not having coffee hour was tough for us. And we, but the, the church is wildly rented out. So we had to have a meeting immediately to figure out how to close the church and get this all done. And um, I, I remember I went to my office because I had all my, my album and everything up there. And I went to reach for it because I was headed for the airport. And, and I, I looked back and I had three people who looked like they were going to cry because I was now taking my album home, which meant I didn't think I was coming back. And so you know what I did? It's still in Fort McMurray. And I yeah. said, I'll come back and get it. Maybe not at Easter, but I'll come back. And, and that was the moment where we discover we have to figure out what the anxiety is and, and, and deal with that. Right. I've found folks are remarkably, just uh, for me, beyond my imagine, I have no idea why they trust us the way they do, right out of the gate. I know. And, and they do. Uh, for me, the stressor is that because I don't know them, I don't know what comfort looks like for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, and those kinds of things. We're learning. We're learning together. But dang it, I wish we didn't have to do it this way. And you need to tell them that. Tell them how hard it is but that, that you're not going anywhere until you know how they need to be loved. Thank you, Diane. I appreciate that. I just uh, want to have a few moments just to talk about uh, a couple of other things. So uh, Diane's videos, we will post uh, links to those so that you can access them. And uh, we really appreciate you taking the initiative to, to do those. And I know that, uh, that people have, who have watched them have found them incredibly helpful. So I encourage you all to do the same. Um, Mark was asking about whether or not you would share your notes um, from today that, so that people could review those. I don't know if you're comfortable with that, but if you are, um, we could, uh, we could make those available. If not, uh, the, um, this has been recorded, so you can go back and, uh, and uh, watch it at a later date if, if, um, if you feel like you need more time to reflect on, on uh, Diane's words. So thanks. Diane, you're welcome to hang around for the rest of our time together if you wish. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I realize lots of, of uh, communities of faith are, are contemplating uh, reopening in some way. Um, so as a region, we are sort of officially cautiously moving into our stage two, which, which does, um, does, which you can refer to our document um, to see what that means. We're still really encouraging not worshiping in person, um, but um, some small group gatherings could happen as long as you meet the uh, requirements. But we recognize that as those decisions happen, inevitably, there's going to be cases of COVID that come up in your space, either in your building or through your rental groups or whatever. So um, Carmen, uh, who is the executive director of First United Church uh, in the downtown east side, um, had that experience this week. And so I thought I would just invite her to share what she learned about what you should do when this happens in in your place. So Carmen, I'm over to you. Thanks, Trina. Um, it's not a very, not a very auspicious way to live up to our name of being first, being first to have the COVID in the church. <laughs> um, and I think, um, you know, just given the context of what's happening in British Columbia and specifically the lower mainland, the demographic of my staff, we have about 85 staff who work at First United. 
um, including our casual staff. And um, even though we have really scaled back to just our shelter operations being operating in the church, um, everything else is available outside by the door. We do our food programs at a takeout window that's been installed at the front door. Our tax intake is at the front window. Um, legal advocacy is done virtually. Um, there's still a lot of people moving in and out of this building. And as we, as the province moved into stage three, we kind of relaxed our PPE requirements and things with, with staff. And so um, the one thing that I can recommend really highly if your congregation doesn't have it is a pandemic response plan. Um, when I looked at our uh, business continuity plan that somebody long before me uh, had done for First United, it was all about earthquakes and uh, there was no pandemic response. And so um, we quickly did one. Um, I'm happy to share it. I can send it to Trina and Mauricio at the, at the regional office um, if you need it as a template. But um, when we did have um, instances of COVID in the building, it made it much less stressful. Um, I think if we'd had COVID immediately in March when the pandemic started to hit this region, that um, it would have been much more challenging and certainly much more stressful for me. Um, I found out at 7 p.m. Um, so we had, a, we had a staff person who tried to come to work on Friday morning, had mild cold symptoms, um, sat and visited with his supervisor for a couple of minutes, and then um, disclosed that he wasn't feeling well, a supervisor said, you know, please take the mask out of your pocket, put it on your face, go to a testing center, get tested, go home and do not come back to work until you have your results. And by 7 p.m. on Saturday night, we had confirmation that the staff person had um, contracted COVID. COVID. And so uh, by 9 p.m., I caught the snack time, like the mug up time with the shelter residents, and we had an all residents meeting. Um, I told the staff who were on site in the moment um, before we met with the before we met with the residents, um, and I did that in person communication with the people who were on site in the building immediately before I said anything electronically to anybody else on the staff. Um, and we basically instituted a policy that uh, masks are required um, in the building. I, I take mine off when I'm in my office with the door closed, but I also have the fan on in my office. So there's always air circulation in here. Um, so masks are required for everybody in the building. We had enough um, disposable surgical uh, masks on hand that we can share them with the shelter residents. And so they're required, if they're in the building, they're required to be wearing a mask unless they are eating, sleeping, or showering. Um, if they start to feel claustrophobic, they need to go outside and go for a walk, get some outside fresh air. Um, but they readily agreed. They were really grateful that we had PPE that they could use. And for our shelter staff, they're required now to wear face shields and masks and everybody else is required to wear a mask. We've also returned to our stage one protocols for everybody else. So um, some of our st admin staff will still be required to come on site at certain points to check mail, do bank deposits, um, process your generous donations, that sort of thing. Um, but for the most part, they are working from home and everybody who can work from home must work from home. And um, we've instituted that for a 14 day period. So. If on September 18th, we have no other connected COVID cases, then we can kind of relax again a little bit. But um, having that pandemic plan really helped us to just take immediate action. Um, I also notified our board uh, right away. On Sunday morning, I woke up and um, came and dealt with, we had a restoration company um, that came in and um, did, we closed the building to the shelter residents. Um, and uh, just for the day from 9.30 to 5.30, and there's a, another drop-in um, with the city of Vancouver where we can provide vouchers for them to access food. So they got bagged breakfasts from us and then went for lunch and dinner at the Evelyn Scholar Center. Um, and uh, we had the entire building fogged with disinfectant. Um, their recommendation was given the complexity and size of the church that um, it would be great to do it again. So we did it again on Monday. So we did two rounds of disinfectant uh, just to be on the safe side. 
Um, just for context, I think we have about 17,000 square feet of usable space in the church, and it's going to cost about $8,000 um, for that disinfectant. But it, I think it's really best practice, and we still have people living and working here. And so um, we're also really lucky that uh, we're eligible for that cost to be recouped through BC Housing's pandemic response um, funds that they've made available, um, because it's really for the protection of our shelter residents. Um, I then got home and had a call from another director saying in our housing society that we also had a staff person uh, who had tested positive for COVID. In that particular situation, we didn't have to respond as, um, we didn't have to have as much of a significant response. That person had been contacted by a provincial health nurse on Tuesday um, while he was at work saying that he had been in contact or somebody in his household had been in contact with somebody who had COVID, was told to leave work, um, did not attend work for the next two days, and then on Thursday night started to have symptoms. Sunday had confirmation that he had COVID. And so um, the way that I've learned a lot about how contact <laughs> tracing works, um, which is that uh, they trace back from 48 hours before the person presents their first symptoms. And because this person was on a watch list and they did not attend work, it actually, um, in the few hours that they were at work in that 48 hour period, um, they did not have any significant interactions with other staff just due to the nature of their work. They're somebody that works very independently. Um, and so we didn't have to do the big disinfectant uh, thing uh, by the time his COVID was diagnosed, um, there, was, there would be no point to doing that. Um, but again, having our pandemic response plan just really allowed us to assess. We, um, I have to say, I have every confidence in the nurses who are doing the contact tracing. Um, they have been phenomenal in um, their communication with us around um, what to do, what the procedures were going to be, how to calm our staff, um, what people should expect, and um, and the really heartening thing was like, if you don't hear, if somebody in your circle comes into contact or, or contracts COVID, that if you don't hear from a public health nurse within 24 to 48 hours, then you can assume that you're not on a watch list, that that interaction has not been significant enough. Um, I don't know if that will change. I did hear Dr. Henry say on the radio this morning that the, the contract tracing nurses are having a hard time keeping up because of the recent spike but we certainly have had a really excellent um, support from them um, and, from, and from the restoration company that we hired to do the disinfectant. I mean, I called, I emailed him at 7.30 on Saturday night and he and his crew were on site at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. So that's just a little bit about our, um, about our experience. So happy to answer any questions, but I realize I think we're out of time too. Um, th yeah, that's okay. Um, they, often we go over and those who have to leave, leave, and we just, we just keep going. Um, one thing that I found really helpful was, was how they determined what close contact was and who needed to go on a watch list and, and who didn't. Um, so maybe you could just say, because it was something about 15 minutes in a small room. Yeah, so it's in a, in a poorly ventilated room. If your interaction is greater than 15 minutes, um, and uh, the risk increases if you are not wearing masks. So we have one, um, one of our leadership team is off on quarantine now because he was the person who had the conversation with his staff in, in his private office. You know, they were six feet apart but weren't, weren't wearing their masks. And so um, now he needs to be off um, for the full quarantine period. Um, yeah, so it, it, it kind of put my mind at ease. I mean, I know it's not, it's not a foolproof system, but it was good to know sort of how high the bar is and also um, just really how much um, wearing masks is important in, in mitigating our risk for COVID. And so I just also want to say a huge thank you because in March when the pandemic hit and 
I didn't know where I would get PPE from, how I was going to keep my staff safe. And we put out a call to United Churches for um, sewing groups and individuals to make us homemade masks, um, thinking like if that was the best that we could do, we would come up a with a way to launder them for staff and everything. And um, somebody at University Hill was able to order us um, a significant number of surgical masks before the provincial government took over the supply chain. And we got those um, later in the month, but we, there has been such a huge amount of um, United Church support for us and in, in providing homemade masks. And so um, because we were able to get the disposable ones for work and for the shelter, we've shared those uh, masks with our housing tenants in the housing societies. We have 189 units and almost 300 individuals who live in First United Housing. And um, so they've, they obviously have access to laundry facilities in those buildings. And so we've been able to share those masks with them. Um, and so that we wouldn't have been able to do that without the support of other congregations. Thank you. Um, I wonder if anyone has any questions. Blair just asked how our staff are doing. So far, as far as we know, they're doing fine. I think they both had quite mild symptoms. Um, I wrote a couple couple of notes. I think the the two things is um, the PPE compliance is like really the the challenge I have now is like walking around and seeing people with like their nose not covered, um, and like really just getting people to wear their masks properly, um, and then. I think this, you know, I was thinking about what's relatable to congregational ministry and the big culture shift. I was talking with this about my, with my chiropractor about this yesterday, is just how high of a bar we have to set for ourselves around not coming to work or to church or to the grocery store when you're sick, right? We're so used to like starting to feel a cold coming on and popping a Dayquil and going about your day. And I think that that's a huge, like, that's one of the best things we can do is not do that. And so our biggest risk is staff trying to attend work. Um, and uh, so I'm really grateful, you know, we're, we're checking in with our staff, the two staff that are affected. Um, yeah. Uh, Carol's asking about uh, your template for the pandemic response plan. Um, so what I'm going to suggest is Carmen will send that to Mauricio and if you would like that just send an email to Mauricio and he can forward that out to you. Um, is it on your website Carmen? Do you have it posted? No. Not on our website but I'm happy to send it to Mauricio. Okay. Good. Um, any other questions? Great. So lots of people um, uh, expressing, uh, asking questions and uh, having anxiety about whether or not to open or not to open. Um, so I will be sending something out, um, a sort of an update on the region's position on that in the next week or so. Um, but uh, we really are um, encouraging people to just kind of hold the line, keep it to small groups and, um, and you know, Remember, it may not be better. I think that's the biggest uh, challenge is that, is that uh, it's not gonna be going back to how it was. And I think some of what Diane talked about this morning can probably help you in your conversations with your congregations around that. Um, but I will get something out to you. Um, you know, we are sort of uh, asking people if they are going to reopen to use stage two protocols that we outlined in our, uh, in our document. So um, I would say that we're moving to stage two is probably overstating it, but we're saying we recognize that some of you are going to want to open and that we're really asking that you stay, uh, you follow the stage two guidelines and uh, do that and please consult with your regional minister about your reopening plan. Um, the, uh, the National Church is um, in the process of um, making a recommendation slash requirement um, that all that masks be required in the church building for worship. So not, you know, in the office when you're the only person in the office and so on, but um, they really, really want um, everybody wearing masks when they're in the church. So they're looking at how, whether or not they can, they have the authority to actually require it. Um, if they do, they will. 
Um, but for any of you in terms of reopening plans, masks should be worn um, for worship. Um, and, uh, and certainly um, we're recommending no singing. Um, and I think that's reinforced by even Bonnie Henry's recent action to say music has to be lower in restaurants so that people don't have to speak more loudly. Like it's really clear that this is an area of concern for people. And so we're just really encouraging people not to take risks in this area, that it's really not worth it. Um, and, uh, and you can see how much time and energy and cost uh, was incurred in Carmen's situation. And, um, you know, certainly she's dealing with vulnerable people, but you're really dealing with, with seniors on a large scale in your communities of faith. And we know that the outcomes for people in that age category with the, who contract COVID are um, significantly more dire than people in the younger demographics. So we really need to keep that in mind. So I'll send something out about that, but um, that's just a, a little, um, yay, you stayed late, you get a little heads up on a few things here. So I'm going to just give you a, a few little bits of information about, um, about what's going on uh, in the region. We have um, opened our office in a limited way. So uh, we'll have our receptionist and our uh, admin support for um, the first third ministries in the office regularly. And then some of us uh, will be in and out of the office um, occasionally. We're not open to the public. So if you need anything or you need an appointment or anything in the, um, in the uh, regional office, you need to phone ahead and make an appointment. So we're really not doing drop-ins, not that people generally just drop in, but, um, but if you ever had that, if you ever had that inclination, uh, don't do that. Um, and, uh, and then we have proper PE, PPE, we have um, partitions, we have hand sanitizer, all the things that are, that are needed. And we actually have had an inspection from WorkSafe, um, a surprise inspection, which we did pass. So that's great. We know we're, we know we're following the rules that, that we need to. Um, Leanne just asked a question about people speaking at worship. Um, it is fine to, to speak without a mask if, in, when you're leading worship if you're at a significant distance from people and not sharing microphones is the uh, advice that, uh, that, we've been, that we've been offering. Um, but if you're not open, then obviously, um, obviously uh, you, you know, you're, what you're doing online, that's less of a concern. Uh, Carmen just noted that that WorkSafe will also come and do an investigation uh, if you have an incident that involves staff. A couple of other things just to bring to your attention. Um, we've uh, got the dates out for the general meeting and there's going to be more information coming to you about the general meeting. Um, we will be uh, sharing an announcement later today uh, in writing, but I wanted you all to be the first to know that our theme speaker for the general meeting is um, is going to be Ron Heifetz, and I'm so excited about that because um, Ron is uh, uh, somebody who knows a lot about leadership. He wrote the book Leadership Without Easy Answers, and really that was the foundational information that we used to develop the leadership programming and network and um, has really been formative in, in the life and work of, of BC Conference and now Pacific Mountain Region. Um, he's a, uh, he's a uh, professor of leadership at Harvard and um, normally we couldn't have him come because he's way too expensive. And so when I was thinking about, you know, I really want this upcoming general meeting to be something really special for you all because we realize that you're all, you're all working in very difficult con con you know, circumstances and, um, and uh, we really want to be able to support you. And so I wanted this to be special. And so on a whim, I just emailed him <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I really want you to come here. And, um, and so because it's, because it's online um, and he doesn't have to travel and it's really a limited amount of time um, and because he's being generous with his time and with us, we were able to do this. And so it really is a gift of COVID um, that we'll be able to have him uh, work with us and explore our, our theme, um, Leadership Beyond the Wilderness. So we're uh, looking forward to it and um, 
wanted to share that all with you and, and just let you know how excited I am. It's like I got to talk with them for about an hour and a half as we were going through the planning and it was kind of like, you know, talking with your with a rock star, you know, I was like in awe the whole time. So it's going to be really great. And I know that uh, it'll be really worthwhile for us. A um, couple of other things um, we have. Um, uh, as you know, we've had a few staff changes. So uh, we've had a staff change in the property portfolio and Don Evans is working with us on that. And um, he's uh, stepped into that admirably and it's, uh, it's been a really great thing to, uh, to work with him. Um, we have had some challenges with some of our property redevelopment projects. And so we're working hard to, um, to work through that. We've also had a staff change in the area of the justice work. And so I wanted to let you know that um, over the course of the fall, uh, we'll be working, we'll be having a consultation around justice work in the region. So there'll be an opportunity for you all to give input into um, what you would identify as the region's priorities in the area of justice work and how um, we can make decisions around the use of our resources to support those identified priorities. Uh, Janet Gray is going to be leading that consultation. Some of you will know her. Um, she's been active in justice networks over the years and I'm really looking forward to, um, to the work that she's going to bring and the information that she's going to provide us so that we can use that to inform um, our justice work going forward. And similarly, we're doing uh, the same thing in the area of campus ministries. Um, so we've got a campus ministry review team in place and the team consists of Mark Green, Catherine Britton, uh, Rian Walker, Ian McLeod, and is staffed by Pamela Evans and Gail Miller. Um, Pamela Evans leads our first third ministry network and uh, our longer term goal is to connect the campus ministry work with the um, with the uh, first third network. The task of the uh, committee is to review the ministry work that's being offered and seek to seek and understand and articulate the regional context for this ministry because at the moment we really just have two um, campus ministries that we focus on. And, um, and so it's a question of whether or not we wanna support two more fully or we wanna support many in smaller ways and then look at identifying possibilities for future expressions of this ministry, paying attention to sustainability and equitable access to, um, to this uh, support. So there's gonna be a call to have some focus groups um, to talk about campus ministries and, um, and we'll need you to register for those. So please do be paying attention to the newsletter so that you can see uh, some of those things that uh, are coming out and some of the opportunities that there are. And then um, also just knowing that leadership and the region in general are working really hard to identify what your needs are and trying to develop and, and offer programming that, uh, that makes, uh, that responds to those um, needs that are out there. Um, so I, I wanted to draw to your attention the uh, Faith Fest, which is happening in the Kootenai area that's open to the whole region and it's focusing on smaller congregations. So if you're part of a smaller congregation, I really, really encourage you to attend um, that virtual conference. It's like $29, but they'll waive it if that makes it inaccessible. And uh, really encourage you to engage with, with that uh, ministry. And then just to check out the different leadership options that are available through, um, through the region, either through the newsletter or the leadership website or the Pacific Mountain website will point you in those directions. And uh, the, uh, the Faith Fest um, uh, in particular is open beyond our borders. So if, uh, if folks are, um, are interested in attending that and want to invite people that they know from other places, they can feel free to do that as well. And somebody said, how small is small? You can decide if it's applicable or not. You can be a large congregation and attend. You will not be turned away. And I'm sure that all of those things, uh, you know, some of that will, will, definitely, uh, will definitely apply in, in many circumstances. 
and um, and small is also really small. So um, so we do encourage anybody that that feels an interest in that to just go ahead and attend. Um, there is also going to be a, a workshop on uh, online worship that's being made available to everyone by leadership for free that's being offered by Marsha McPhee. So I really encourage you to attend that because that'll just be fantastic. Her resources for facilitating worship leadership are just really, really, really spectacular. So invite you to, uh, to take advantage of that as well. So I think that's the end of our paid commercial announcements here. So uh, if anybody has any questions, please uh, feel free to put them in the chat box or uh, unmute yourself or raise your hand and I'm happy to respond to them. Um, Sandra's asking if uh, webinars are uh, available for viewing. I believe that everything has been uh, saved and is available online. Um, so if there's something in particular you're looking for, if it's a leadership resource, you could email Allison Rennie or you can always just check with Mauricio and he'll point you in the direction of, uh, of where things are. Okay. Uh, Jay, you have a question? Yeah, I understand that there are some churches that are surveying their folks about their comfort levels about opening or not. And I'm wondering if you're hearing sort of generally about that and whether there's, you know, any kind of pattern of yes or no decision around that. Mm -hmm. uh, my in the two regions, I would say it's similar. Um, and uh, there has been a number of, of people who've done surveys. Um, in larger churches, generally the sense is to not come back because, um, because of the challenges of deciding who can come and who can't uh, due to the required restrictions and numbers. Um, there are a few smaller churches who on a good day would have 12 people. Those ones uh, are kind of opting more to, to open and gather in person if their buildings are able to um, manage the social distance. Um, but I think that there's a lot of discomfort about coming together in person. Um, and so I would say that the large majority of people are opting not to open. Um, and, and it is in the more smaller and more rural places where they are opting to open. Um, certainly in the lower mainland, I think, I think there needs to be huge, huge, huge caution because the numbers that we've got here are, are really high. And, um, and so I would, uh, I would suggest <laughs> that, uh, that in the lower mainland, holding off um, for at least until October to find out what's happening with people returning to school and all of that would be highly advisable. Um, you know, in other places where the numbers are, are lower and, and the risk is less, um, it, it might be a different decision. So we're, we are looking at kind of regional differences within the region as well. Um, it's, a, it's a bit more challenging in like in places like Alberta where they've actually lifted the limit for religious services. So they actually don't limit the numbers there at all. Um, and so people are, um, you know, churches are under more pressure to open there than here. Um, but, uh, but even there, most of the churches are opting not to. Yeah, that's unfortunate. And uh, yeah. looking at what's been happening, it isn't working well for them, I don't think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I think we're in a glass house at this point because our numbers are higher than most places. <laughs> so. Yeah, indeed. I noticed, um, you know, Blair's comment that they, that they surveyed at Queen's and there was a very high level of discomfort. I'm assuming that means in opening. Yeah, they're, they're choosing not to open at Queen's. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Great. Any other questions? Okay, well, I know we're really over time and I appreciate you all hanging in there. Um, Blair, would you like to close our time with prayer? And then if people do have questions, I can hang around for a little bit after. You're muted. That's the quote of 2020. You're muted. Oh, oh, you're muted. <laughs> I see it on t-shirts, on masks. <laughs> Let's pray together, friends. Holy One, you've promised 
that where two or more are gathered, you would be amongst us. And that is certainly true. We give you thanks for this time together where colleagues and friends hang out together to be held in the company of each other's presence to to know that what we are experiencing is shared by many. We give you thanks for Carmen's witness. We give you thanks for Diane's uh, gift of grace and hospitality, holding our experience in divine in your divine love. As we leave this time, uh, empower our work, empower us that we might be healthy vessels for the mending of your world, for the holding of your story, for the proclaiming of your gospel. That is still blessed good news in a world that craves it. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you, Carmen, and everybody at first. Yes, and if you want to support the ministry at first, that's definitely needed. I uh, encourage you to head over to their website and make a donation and, uh, and certainly to let your congregations know that they could really use your support during this pandemic. Um, thank you, Carmen and uh, Blair and uh, Diane, I think has already left for uh, your gift of leadership today. You're welcome. Bye, everyone.